What's up guys, Rain Knight back and we are in the last week of the Bizarre Indiegogo. Thank you so much to everyone who's been supporting the game so far. It's been so awesome to read all the positive comments online and just all the suggestions that you guys have had on how to make the game better. So today what I wanted to do is uh, go through and kind of show you how an average game might play out and kind of what I had in mind for common decision trees and the things that you'd experience as a player. We're going to be showing you this with a very conceptual build of the game. This is not a demo, this is not alpha, this is not beta. The game will look nothing like this. This is just a visual representation of the mechanics that we want to show you guys. So yeah, don't, don't read into it too much. Even the stuff that looks finished, it's not. It'll look nothing like that when the game's released, and there's going to be a lot of placeholder art. All right, so before we jump into a game, I kind of want to show you guys what you're going to be looking at uh, in this conceptual build. So first of all, this is my hand. I got some money uh, when I play it. Get some, uh, when I play my coins, I get some money for the turn. I got some weapons, which are going to give me attack for the turn. And over here, we have the two circles that are going to represent those resources right now. So the crown circle is representing how much money we have right now. Attack circle is going to represent how much attack we have right now. And uh, over here, we have our potion, our hero trait. Every hero has a unique one. I get to use that whenever I want. I'm the wizard, so I'm gonna make some potions. Over here in the center, we have the, one of the core mechanics in the game, which are your four main stores. So these ovals right now are gonna be representing where the stores will be in the game. This is where different monsters and items and spells show up. And uh, depending on the, one, the monsters that I kill or the spells that I cast or the items that I buy, it's gonna influence my deck. This is where I'm deciding what cards to interact with, what cards to add to my deck, to buy, what monsters to kill, etc. So these four are going to be unique to the wizard. The cards that are showing up are only for the wizard. These ones up here are my opponents. I also got to focus on those. Um, and those are only going to be for the vampire class, my, my opponent this time. I can't buy my opponent's cards. Only they can, and only I can buy my cards. Over here on the right, we got the three neutral stores. So we got a two value coin that either of us can buy at any time. And then we have two neutral monsters here which we can kill to get a reward. I also have my deck over here on the left uh, which you know has the cards in it right now in the beginning of the game. I have my discard pile that's going to be shown up on the right. And then I have this purple swirly zone which uh, we're calling purgatory right now which is kind of the zone that is going to represent where the different cards that I played this turn or bought this turn that's where they're going to go. And then at the end of the turn they go from purgatory to discard. Hopefully that gives you guys kind of an idea of what's going on and uh, let's jump into a game. So the first thing that's going to happen is a coin's going to flip to decide who goes first and then we're going to jump into the mulligan. The game's going to start off with a mulligan so both players are going to get to change the top card of any of their stores up to four times. So there's a mechanic in the game called bump. Bumping just means replace the top card, knock it off of a any of the, the store areas. Um, so right now uh, we're just representing mulliganing by you know clicking on these little overly indicator areas. So what I'm gonna do is get rid of the more uh, expensive cards usually, uh, but right now I don't have too many. I kinda like all four of these cards to be honest. Let's see, Pyrology is gonna draw a card for each card in my hand. That card's better late game so I'm gonna get rid of that one right there. Philosopher's Stone can constantly be reused to grow my deck economically. It's a very good card to buy early. And so are Enchanted Fireworks. Enchanted Fireworks don't grow my deck economically, but they keep putting Firebolts into my deck to improve it. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get rid of this uh, Meditation Tome. I'm gonna get rid of Playing with Fire. I'm gonna keep these other cards. All right, so this is my first turn. So every single turn of the game, you're gonna draw five cards. Uh, the cards don't cost any mana to play or anything. There's no mana in the game. If you wanna play a card, you just play it. So I played a coin. I have one money for the turn. I play my second coin, I get a second money. Everybody's deck, right now in this conceptual build, starts with 12 cards. So 10 of those are these coins that make one money, and two of them are these swords, which give you one attack, and they also draw a card to replace themselves. So by clicking on my deck area, I can see kind of the representation of what cards are in my deck right now. I got the coins, I got the second sword. So I'm gonna play my sword, go up to one attack, I'm just going to play the rest of my coins so that I know how much money I have to work with. So, I got five coins, I got one attack to work with. What am I going to do with my five coins? Well, I have a lot of options, right? I can buy a potion plus this two value coin to kind of help grow my deck economically. Um, I can get enchanted fireworks. So, this is, if I want to go for a more aggressive strategy, this is what I would pick up, right? Because enchanted fireworks 
they add fire bolts to my deck every time I play them. A fire bolt is a, it's a weapon that does damage. So if I buy fireworks early, uh, I'm going to be getting a lot of weapons and I'm going to be doing damage to my opponent faster and, and sooner. So uh, I'm going to get Philosopher's Stone. I'm going to go for more of the economic route. I want to get more money so I can buy more stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and just yeah, go for my money, pick up the Philosopher's Stone. And that Philosopher's Stone, again, there's no animations or feedback mechanisms to show this right now. But the Philosopher's Stone that I just spent money for got added to my Purgatory. So now it's sitting over here. And uh, at the end of my turn, all of these cards that I just played and bought, all of them are going to go to my discard. So I got no more money. I got one attack left over. I'm going to go ahead and attack my opponent in the face the way it's intended to be done. So Vampire is going to drop to 34. I'm going to end my turn and go to the next one. So now we're going into turn two. Uh, the Vampire, my opponent, bought a long sword, hit me for one damage. No big deal. I've drawn five more cards, and now at this point, I only have one more card left in my deck. I got a coin in there. So I'm going to go ahead and play my sword, draw my last card from my deck, and all of a sudden, I have no more cards in my deck. If you have no cards in your deck and you have to draw a card, then your discard pile over here is going to shuffle into your deck. So that Philosopher's Stone that we bought on turn one, all of a sudden, it's going to get shuffled back into my deck next turn, and I'm going to be able to draw that card and play it. So all these cards that I'm adding to my deck throughout a game, I'm going to start playing and you know as I play the game my deck develops and uh, and grows and has a different play style every single time based on the decisions that I made so I'm gonna play my five coins again get some money to work with and I am gonna go ahead and well I have a few options here so I can I can pick up pyromancer's coin pyromancer's coin is an interesting card it every time I play it I get three money instead of one so it's a very powerful coin the problem is it burns me every time. And what a burn is, is it's a bad card in my deck that I don't want in there. A burn is a card that replaces itself by drawing a card, but it also does one damage to me. So the more of them I add to my deck, the more they start hurting me throughout a game. So it kind of hurts you to buy early, but at the same time, you want more money to work with early. So if I want to be really aggressive, I think we pick up the coin. Uh, I can also take a little bit of a safer pick here with Enchanted Fireworks and start kind of filling my deck with Firebolts to kill the opponent. Um, and then we have... Mystic Furnace over here, which is a very powerful card. Um, Mystic Furnace lets me cleanse. Uh, and this is something I want to talk about. So cleanse is another very common mechanic in the game. When you cleanse, you basically remove a card from your deck. And what cleanse does is it removes the worst card from your deck. So you remove, you know, like a burn, for example, from Pyromancer's Coin. So if I pick up the coin, I probably want to pick up the furnace as well, because they work together very well. You know, I get these burns in my deck, but then the, the furnace gets rid of them. I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is pick up that coin. Let's, let's go for that strategy. Those two cards work together. And uh, I'm going to pass on the, the fireworks and pick that up. So when I buy that card, it gets replaced with a new one. Okay, so I can't afford anything else. I got one attack. Let's go ahead and hit the vampire for one damage. By the way, the reason the vampire is at 31 life is because uh, she bought a card that costs life to purchase. That's kind of the, the vampire trait. Anyway, let's go to the next turn. All right, so going into turn three, you can see my discard pile just shuffled back into my deck. So I'm going to be drawing five cards again. And this time, my deck is going to include all these cards that I bought. So based on the decisions I made in the first couple turns, I have two very powerful cards in here to work with that are going to kind of help shape how the rest of my gameplay pans out. So I'm going to play a couple of these swords. I got two attack, and now I have a Pyromancer's Coin. So I'm going to play the Pyromancer's Coin. It's going to give me a lot of money to work with this turn, but it's also adding a burn to my deck. And a burn is a card that, you know, I, I really don't want in there. It's a drawback. As I add more and more burns to my deck, every single time that, I, that I'm going to play that Pyromancer's Coin, I want to make sure that I'm getting rid of them. So because of my decision to buy, Mystic Fur or to buy Pyromancer's Coin, I'm going to buy Mystic Furnace to kind of offset that drawback so I can start cleansing the burns away. And, and that's really the, the, the idea behind this, right? It's not just about figuring out, okay, what's the best card in a vacuum? I'm going to buy that one every time. It's about taking into account what you've already picked up and have that influence your future buying decisions. And more importantly than that, I want to be thinking about what my opponent's doing. So the vampire opponent this time around, you, you guys didn't see it because we cut it out, but you know they bought the longsword. So my opponent's going for a more aggressive strategy. Picked up a big weapon. It's going to do a lot of damage to me. You know I'm going to keep that in mind when it comes to the types of cards I want to add to my deck. I'm going to try to pick up some defensive tools if I can to kind of stem the bleeding against the vampire's aggressive game plan. So I'm going to pick up the furnace. And that's going to leave me with three money left over. 
which I'm going to use to buy this coin up here. It's a pretty solid card to pick up early. It's going to help me buy more stuff. My two attack isn't enough to kill any of these monsters, so I'm just going to go ahead and attack the vampire. And that's kind of a summary of how the early game works out, right? You take a few turns, you decide what your first few cards are going to be. And, uh, you know, as the game progresses and develops, you want to be keeping in mind what you've already bought and make decisions accordingly. So we're a few turns into the game now. I have four money to work with this turn. And what I'm going to do is basically I have to make a decision. Uh, either I can keep trying to make my own deck better and pick up this big coin over here in order to you know, improve the amount of money that I can generate every turn on average, which helps me buy more stuff, improve my deck even more. Or I have the choice of picking up this Blizzard card over here, which is going to make it harder for my opponent to buy stuff. Um, so I really have to decide, you know, do I want to focus on my own game plan or do I want to, you know, do some counterplay and slow down what the vampire is trying to do? And this time I'm going to go for slowing down the opponent. So I'm going to pick up the blizzard and all of his stores are going to get covered by ice wall. So in order to buy the cards under those, he's going to have to break those ice walls first by spending his attack on them. So this is one example of a type of common counterplay, but other examples would include putting bad cards into your opponent's deck so that, you know, the stuff they're drawing on average every turn is a lot worse. You know, another example would include bumping. When you remove the top card of a store, you can target your own stores and get rid of the, the crap so you have more good options. But you can also target your opponent's card that they're really trying to set themselves up to buy. Um, so if there's a card that's really going to be effective against your strategy, you want to keep that in mind and, and try to kind of either cover it up or bump it out of the way so your opponent can't get to it. And that's why it's really important not just to be thinking about your own game plan and your own deck, but you also want to keep in mind what your opponent's doing and how that's going to affect your specific matchup. So not every card that shows up in one of your stores is going to be a card that's always good to buy. Uh, you really have to make a judgment call. So this Viper over here, for example, when I kill it, I get two fangs, which are pretty decent weapons. And it's really cheap to kill. It only takes one attack. But it also has a drawback at the same time of adding a poison to my deck. And poison is something that's going to mess with my draws and hurt me. So you know, I have to make the decision as a player, you know, is this an aggressive matchup? Can I afford to have a poison in my deck? How important is it for me to get those two weapons? At the same time, if I never buy the Viper, it's just always going to be covering up that store slot until I bump it out of the way. So, you know, maybe killing it just to see what's under it makes sense. And this is kind of a, a very common decision that you have to make with a card that has a benefit, but also a drawback. All right, so we're kind of going into the end of the mid game here. Uh, I built up a pretty good sized deck. We got 31 cards in there, 13 in Purgatory. I've added a bunch of cards to my deck. My opponents added a bunch of cards to my deck. It's kind of taking a, a shape of its own based on the decisions that I've made uh, and has its own play style. I've gone with a very heavy potion strategy this game. I want to talk a little bit about this servant that's on my side of the board because that's a card that my opponent placed on my side of the board. So the servant only has one health. Uh, it's a pretty weak monster, but it's not one that I can just ignore indefinitely like most monsters because the servant is going to do one damage to me at the beginning of every single turn. So the vampire, one of their strategies is stacking up a lot of servants, for example. Um, so some monsters, as an example of counterplay, uh, not just monsters, but anything that you put on the opponent's side of the table, some of them are going to have cumulative effects. They're either going to do damage every single turn, or they're going to spawn more bad cards on their side of the table, like a lair, until you kill them. Um, and these are kind of examples of you know, the, the design space we want to explore. I, I want to make sure that, unlike a lot of traditional deck building games, that we incorporate a lot of counterplay. There should be a lot of ways to interact with your opponent and slow down their game plan or speed your, your own up, right? And you should always have the option of doing both. So now we're in the final stages of the game here. Both me and my opponent have built up decks over the course of a game. We have a ton of powerful cards, weapons. My opponent's put a bunch of stuff in my deck. I put a bunch of stuff in his. Some of them have drawbacks. Some of them are powerful. Some of them synergize with other things that are bought. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to play my last few cards, gain my attack, and uh, finish my opponent off. And uh, this is kind of, uh, keep in mind, again, conceptual build. This is not at all what the game's going to look like. This is just uh, you know, something we put together to kind of show you guys the, the vision and kind of the idea of how I want a game to play out. 
Um, but you know, moving forward, there's going to be so many things outside of what we saw that are going to be incorporated into this game. This game, I built a pretty balanced deck. I didn't go all in on, on weapons and aggression. I didn't go all in on defensive cards. I didn't go all in on being like a frost mage and just icing my opponent out of being able to buy cards. Those are all things I could have done based on the cards that showed up, but I decided to draft a bit more of a balanced deck that just kind of used potions for a boost uh, every single turn. The cool thing is, when two players play this game, the game plays out in a different way every single time, not just because of the RNG, but because of the decisions that the other player made. So if I was a player that really liked Frost Wizard, or Cryomancer, or whatever you want to call it, right? If I wanted to make like a Cryomancer deck, that's my favorite wizard archetype, I could have drafted that this game. And it would have been on my opponent to know what the best strategy is against that. Vice versa, based on what the vampire, or my opponent this game was building, it influenced the decisions of what I was buying. So not only did I want to pick up cards that have good synergy together just within my own deck, but I wanted to react to what my opponent was building and doing to make their strategy less effective. And this is kind of the idea, right? I want to make sure that every single class in the game, every hero that you play, has multiple different archetypes that you can build within it. And picking which one of those archetypes to go with doesn't just come down to the cards that show up. It depends, it comes down to what your opponent's doing and how you want to react to that. So just to reiterate, this is a conceptual build of the game. The final product is gonna look nothing like this. This is just a way for us to kind of show you how an average game might play out and kind of uh, an idea of our vision for the game moving forward. Thank you so much to everybody that's been supporting the Indiegogo up until this point. Uh, whether we hit that goal or not, I'm making this game, but for those of you guys that do want to support it, be a part of the process, and get some good value out of it uh, along the way, make sure you go ahead and support it, check it out. Um, just one week left to go. Hopefully we get there. Tell your friends about it. I'll see you guys in the next update.